in 2 Corinthians chapter 6 verse 14 through to chapter 7 verse 1, we have a passage that is often used to urge people to leave their churches or denominations. So Paul writes, Do not be unequally yoked with unbelievers. For what partnership has righteousness with lawlessness? Or what fellowship has light with darkness? What accord has Christ with Belial? Or what portion does a believer share with an unbeliever? What agreement has the temple of God with idols? For we are the temple of the living God. As God said, I will make my dwelling among them and walk among them, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Therefore, go out from their midst and be separate from them, says the Lord. Touch no unclean thing, then I will welcome you, and I will be a father to you, and you shall be sons and daughters to me, says the Lord Almighty. Second Corinthians chapter 6 into chapter 7. Since we have these promises, Paul concludes uh, this section, let us cleanse ourselves from every defilement of body and spirit, bringing holiness to completion in the fear of God. This is all strong, binary language, isn't it? It speaks to what our partnerships and our associations ought to be. So one can see why some people think it is about pursuing doctrinal purity and leaving apostate churches. However, as Paul Barnett rightly says in his commentary, there is no call here, as is often claimed, for Christian to separate from Christian for doctrinal or ethical reasons. It is about separation from paganism and not withdrawal from Christians with whom doctrinal differences exist. You see, the distinction in verse 15 is between a believer and an unbeliever. The going out from their midst is not so much a physical departure, a ghettoization or a secession from a bad institutional affiliation as such, but a spiritual departure, i.e. go out spiritually by not following their life, as Thomas Aquinas put it. And Paul concludes, since we have these promises, beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from every defilement of body and spirit, bringing holiness to completion in the fear of God. He does not conclude, therefore, let us start a purer church. You see, what Paul wants is for those who have imported aspects of a pagan worldview into their Christianity to repent of this. He is not telling those who haven't to give up on the church of God that is at Corinth and walk away to form the real church of God at Corinth. He calls for the Corinthians to realise that they can't be both believers and unbelievers at the same time. They must take a decisive step out of the world, the sphere of darkness and Belial and lawlessness, and they must throw their lot in with Christ, righteousness and light. He's not talking about separating from false believers or from errant Christians, but separating from Babylon, the world, the Gentile cults of Corinth and their corrosive morality. So this is not a call for secession from one denomination to another or to some form of independent congregationalism. To misappropriate the allusion to Isaiah 52, go out from their midst and be separate from them, in that sort of way, is probably pushing it beyond what Paul intended. Although there is teaching on how to relate to Christians in other places, the New Testament doesn't seem to have a very developed doctrine of denominations. Besides, if Paul does have different groups of Christians in mind here, 
the application of this passage is not to the purer ones who are worried about being contaminated by the more licentious. No, the application is to the worldly Christians themselves, whose behaviour seems more in line with the surrounding culture than with biblical injunctions. That is, what I'm saying is, this is a text to preach to Christians who are in love with this present world, not to godly potential seceders that you would like to join your group instead. Later on in his letter, Paul responds at length to so-called super-apostles and their own false teaching in 2 Corinthians chapters 10 to 13. He particularly describes his approach in 2 Corinthians 10 verses 1 to 6. He employs a martial metaphor to describe his activity for the gospel with the word stratuamai, to engage in warfare. He speaks of the weapons that we are to use in fighting valiantly. He writes, By the humility and gentleness of Christ I appeal to you, I, Paul, who am timid when face to face with you, but bold towards you when away. I beg you that when I come, I may not have to be as bold as I expect to be towards some people who think that we live by the standards of this world. For though we live in the world, we do not wage war as the world does. The weapons we fight with are not the weapons of the world. On the contrary, they have divine power to demolish strongholds. We demolish arguments and every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God, and we take captive every thought to make it obedience to Christ. And we will be ready to punish every act of disobedience once your obedience is complete. 2 Corinthians chapter 10. Paul rather subverts the martial imagery by beginning this passage with humility and gentleness. Humility and gentleness are not characteristics which usually mark the effective soldier in battle. And that is precisely Paul's point. He does not wage war in a worldly way, with aggression, but in weakness and in apparent defeat. Nor does he employ worldly weapons. Rather, he contends using words, God's words, which have divine power to demolish strongholds and to refute arguments, just as the gospel, the words of the gospel, bring light to darkness in 2 Corinthians chapter 4. Paul seeks not to capture and enslave people to his will, but to conquer and subdue their minds for Christ, to be his active allies. This is evangelical warfare, seeking victory through Christ-like gentleness by the power of the gospel itself. Presumably the so-called super-apostles in Corinth were relying on seemingly more impressive techniques and strategies to attract and captivate their followers. As Thomas Aquinas comments, the weapons of those who fight according to the flesh or wage war are riches, pleasures and worldly and temporal honours and power. Those things can be very persuasive. So here are some questions for reflection for today. First, why would it be misusing 2 Corinthians 6 to use it as a call to leave the Church of England? Secondly, who does need to hear the strong message of 2 Corinthians chapter 6? And thirdly and finally, how can we fight the good fight with the humility and gentleness of Christ? I'll leave you to ponder those things prayerfully yourself.